Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. My name is Dr. Taksapon Tamarangsi, or call me Meg. Um, welcome to the um, seventh uh, episode of the Healthy Health Population webinar series. Before we start the session, let me introduce you the ground rule. Uh, first of all, the, um, our webinar open to all, but please respect each other. We allow all the registered participants and please mute your microphone if it accidentally unmute. We have 50% um, for presentation for six of panelists today and the last half will be on Q&A. So everyone get a chance to speak. Everyone is speaker and can contribute. So if you go to the chat box, please type your question and your comment. Please ensure that it sent to all, pan all panelists and attendees. So it is open to all. Um, and we will um, select some question, some comment, and we try to have a live um, delivery of this question and comment, let's say, uh, around six to 10. We, unfortunately, we cannot give the certificate. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, um, during your registration, you, you should have uh, the, the, the link in, sent to you. So this is the web page dedicated to the web, this episode for the, the worker health. If you go there, all PowerPoint is uploaded there. You can see a lot of material, tools, video, the advocacy material, publications is there. So please feel free to visit. In case you have some issue with connectivity and you cannot see the slide clearly, you can go to download from directly from the web page there. Next, please. In terms of worker health, more than 3.5 billion of world populations are considered as worker. And in many countries, in particular in, in our region, more than 50% of these workers are put in as informal sector, in informal employment sector. When we talk about worker health, we can look at it in many perspectives. Firstly, in terms of individual, these workers are a group of individuals who have their own health profile, their health risks. But we are not talking only about health as a, uh, disease only, but we talk about health in terms of well being. So it is not only about disease, not only about physical, but we talk about mental health, we talk about social health as well. The second perspective is that this is the, when we talk about worker health, it is about condition and about environment that can enable individual to have better health. And last uh, but not least, the, the, the perspective to worker health, many see the worker health program as an investment to boost up productivity. If you boost up productivity for individual, you boost up productivity for aggregated level as well. So this is investment for socioeconomic development. Of course, when we talk about worker health, many of us here focusing on health workforce, which is part of this human resource for health, is part of the worker health. But today we talk in general. We have, um, we, we have a special uh, episode on health and well-being of the health workforce later on. And by nature, the worker health program require effort from multi-sectoral and then pop up is COVID-19. COVID-19 affects everyone directly and indirectly. It affects every worker. It affects every organization. And we have arrangement as a coping or compensatory mechanism for COVID-19 itself or by because of the COVID-19 unintended consequence. Uh, so we have come with new norms, new ways, new rules, new arrangement for work. And this, we can see the transition of occupational health risks. We have the, the um, previous health risks that we are not effectively addressing, and we have emerging health risks come together with COVID-19. So people talk about new norm as a post-COVID-19. I would like to argue that this is not post-COVID yet. We have to live with COVID until a long while. So we are talking about during and post-COVID-19 altogether, but the issue is how to uh, make the new norm a better norm. Today we have uh, panelists, six panelists from um, 
multisectoral as we planned. We have um, Dr. Dr. Malsi Kavarti from the Ministry of Health, Indonesia. We have Ms. Rovena Sain from the Unilever uh, Thailand, so she's from private sector. We have Ms. Susan Thomas from the Self-Employed Women's Association of Seva India. So the, she talked very much about the informal uh, employment sector and the female uh, uh, consideration of uh, workers. And we have Ms. Chetna Laku Verbeek, um, Chief um, Conference Management and General Service, and Ms. Elizabeth Kenyon, uh, both from UN Economic and so Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or UNSCAP. Together with uh, Ms. Chetna and Elizabeth, will be Dr. Teolisa to come during the, the Q&A time. And lastly, and not least, of course, we have Dr. Ivan Ivanov, Team Lead for Occupational and Workplace Health from the WHO headquarters from Geneva. Without uh, losing any time, let's go to Dr. Dr. Ibu Dr. The floor is yours for five minutes. Please unmute and deliver your speech. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. In line with the theme of today's seminar, Workers' Health, I will share Indonesian experience in initiating health protocols at workplaces and public places to prevent and control COVID-19. Next, Indonesia first uh, was declared in, Mar in March uh, 2020, and since then, Indonesia has undergone restriction of people mobility at any settings. After three months of restriction, Mr. Joko Widodo, our president, has launched public statement at New Norms era as soon as this slide on June 2020. His direction is adopted nationally and Ministry of Health was urged to develop the new norms health protocol immediately. Next, this is a race map of COVID-19 uh, cases by District Indonesia. It's shown that the situation of COVID-19 in Indonesia varies a lot across districts, cities, and provinces. The latest data shows that there are 31 districts highly affected by COVID-19 and 177 districts are at moderate risk. The slide shows all that uh, in general, there is still increasing COVID-19 cases trends until today. Next. Pandemic forced Indonesian people to live with a new order of life. New norms is a condition where people can carry out daily activities by practicing health life, healthy life, but still safe from COVID-19. Some efforts that have been made by the Ministry of Health in the direction of new life arrangement, including formulating of health protocols. Next, please. Workplaces, in particular offices and industries, hold essential points to ensure the sustainability of private business and economic growth, to ensure that people work and be productive as well as still stay healthy and safe from COVID-19. There are some factors and principles, so-called health protocols, that should be applied. There are two important components that should be enforced, which are the individual health protection and the public health protections. All stakeholders, including multi-sectors, local authorities, professionals, community organizations, private sectors, should get involved together to implement the health protocols at any settings. Next, please. Individual health protection consists of key individual measures to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. It is also important to monitor vulnerable groups and ensure the implementation of clean and healthy behavior practices and disinfection of equipment use. Next. Public health protection in general is implemented by expecting all components of the community to prevent and control COVID-19 while applying principles of prevention efforts, including promotion and protection, case finding or to detect, and handling quickly and effectively or quick response. Next. The workers' health should be monitored not only at work settings, but also at their mobility from and back from home. At work setting, it should be ensured that all workers stay healthy and productive during the working hours. Ministry of Health launched the Decree 328 2020 to ensure the protection of workers from COVID-19 by strengthening the implementation of health protocol at offices and industry setting. And Ministry of Health also endorsed Decree 
2020 on the implementation of health protocol at public places. This decree regulates mobility, movement, and interaction of people, crowd, physical contact, and probable contamination based on movement of virus in 12 categories of public facilities. Next. This slide shows the implementation of health ministerial decree regarding health protocols, new norms at various public places. Next. Next. In closure, the adaptation of the new, nor new, nor new norms is summarized as follow. Both health ministerial degree have received positive responses from multi-stakeholders. To all sectors adopting those two protocols and developing more technical guidance in their each setting. Three, specific health protocol was also launched for managing the arrival of lots of Indonesian migrant workers as well as returning Indonesia. Four, COVID-19 has affected lots of dimension of life, health, social, economic, and psychological. We need to adapt new lifestyle culture to be able to survive. May the Almighty God be with us and protecting us always. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu um, Dia. So it is very, very clear for us. That the first is the, the, the leadership from the government and then the, the collaboration across sector. So that is very important. And then the agreed uh, vision in terms of target and protocol and enforcement. So the, um, my pop-up question is that um, uh, how we monitor this compliance of the protocol as well. Uh, we have a very good idea from Pretty Koma in the chat box and saying that uh, going back too soon to the, um, the work might lead to a new spike of, of COVID-19 case. Um, so that is, um, uh, this, uh, let's say, a notion to all of us. Uh, please, for all the attendees, please put uh, your question and comment in the chat box and we will go to, to that chat box later on. Um, now let's go to Ms. Rovana Sain from Unilever Thailand. She's the HR director there. Rovana, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, doctor. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Dia. Uh, hello, my name is Rowena C. I am uh, with the Human Resources in Unilever Thailand. Unilever has a proud 87 years history in Thailand and it's really an honor for us to share our practices to the community as an example from the private sector. Next. So in the next five minutes, I will take you through the following, focusing mainly on the measures we took at the, at the start of the pandemic and the measures that we're still continuously taking both in our office and in the factory uh, to keep our people, their families and the community safe. And hopefully these are some, um, there are some ideas that uh, the, the rest of the community can take for, from this. Uh, next. So first on well-being, well-being is a huge priority for Unilever. And when we talk about well-being, for us, it covers these four areas, physical, mental, emotional, and uh, purposeful. I'd like to call out mental well-being as uh, one of the things that we have instituted in Unilever as early as 2018 is an employee assistance program for all employees. Essentially, this is a 24-hour service uh, with the aim to ensure that all Unilever employees is one call, one click away from help, anytime, anywhere. Yeah, and uh, we have seen that this service has really become very helpful for our employees, especially at this time. The, the number of calls logged in has substantially increased, which indicates to us that this has been very helpful for our employees. At the start of the pandemic, there was also five major work streams that Unilever put in place, covering supply, demand, and not surprisingly, the work streams on people uh, is the number one priority and where most resources have gone in. Next. The realities of COVID uh, was different for our office-based people and our factory-based people. Uh, Unilever globally was one of the first few companies to get to, to allow people to just work from home as an early precautionary measure. For our factories, we continued operations as we are producing health and hygiene products that's, that is considered an uh, essential item. You would see in that colorful chart there, it's tier one to tier five. It's a tier system that we followed for all our factories globally. It's a very stringent process where each, uh, under each of the tier, there are very strict guidelines in terms of how we manage our shuttle buses in the factory, our changing rooms, our factory canteens, our production lines, um, and, and then the offices in, in the factory. So very stringent guidelines that was a consistent approach across Unilever. Most of our factories were in tier four, some were in tier five, depending on the severity of the situation of the country. 
For the office-based people, we ramped up our collaboration tools to enable people to really be able to work from home properly. Uh, we instituted a care program, essentially to connect our people to what's happening within the company via town halls, uh, team check-ins. Uh, we put in Aspire programs to make sure that we continue to focus on people development. There were a lot of resilience initiatives ranging from different well-being programs like Zumba, virtual Zumba classes, exercise, dance classes. We also partnered with Fitness First in Thailand. And there were energized programs to make sure that even while people follow social distancing, we don't allow our people to become emotionally distant. And obviously a lot of virtual learning was really stepped up, yeah? And at the bottom, you would see there some of the things that we embedded across our factory and our office. There is an incident management team that docks in with the global incident management team that covers all the measures that we have in place. Obviously, the other things like safety masks, uh, increased cleaning on site, the daily health check, which is very similar to what all the other organizations are doing. And I've also mentioned earlier the employee assistance program that has really been very key to help our people in terms of mental well-being. Uh, next, please. Leading for the new normal. Uh, we are now seeing a lot of countries easing their restrictions, community restrictions, and companies allowing people back into the workplace. Yeah. So for Unilever, we are also in that stage. We, we have our global easement guidelines that follows a four by four approach. In terms of lens, we look at the WHO guidelines, uh, Unilever values, local government guidelines, and very important would also be the employee lens. We uh, absolutely respect people's comfort levels into coming back into the workplace. Uh, we also have four principles that we followed in terms of getting people back into the office. And again, not surprisingly, people's safety remained to be the number one priority. Uh, we have also the safe six essentials that's part of uh, the global guidelines. So I mentioned earlier that we have the tier system for the factory. We have a similar tier system for the office. Yeah, um, and in this tier system, we have the safe six essentials return to workplace. So in, there are six buckets here. In each of the buckets, there are guidelines that every Unilever country or company has to follow. I will now focus a bit more in terms of the prepare work, uh, preparing the workforce and communicating with confidence, because I believe this is perhaps the area where a lot of us in this community can, can take a, um, a lot of ideas from. Next. Preparing the workforce. So for Unilever Thailand, we officially, quote unquote, opened, uh, opened our office where people returned back to the workplace two days ago, July 21st. Uh, again, this is Unilever Thailand. Different countries follow the different timeline depending on approvals and depending on country situation. And as a principle, we have communicated also uh, to all our employees that we, uh, at the maximum, we see only around 30% of the original building occupants coming back into the workplace. So we went into an exercise of determining um, who must be coming back depending on the work that they do, right? And again, as I mentioned, uh, absolutely following and respecting people's comfort level into coming back. There were mandatory trainings for all line leaders and employees, and this is very important for all the people coming back into the workplace to, to uh, understand and be aware of all the protocols that we have in place. Uh, in terms of easing employees into the workplace, uh, we also, as a principle, we follow that once a country opens up in terms of community restrictions, we followed a 21-day waiting period to ensure that the situation in that country and in that community is really safe. So at the bottom, sh just shows you a, a, a bit of flavor of the things that we did in terms of the survey, all the conversations. And I just like to highlight on the one-on-one -on -one conversations, all line managers were also trained in terms of having that one-on-one -on -one with their employees, with their direct reports, to make sure that whatever concerns that employees had, it was something that we were able to really capture. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. In the next two slides, I'll just show you some shots of um, our, our workplace right now. Uh, I did say earlier that we officially eased people back into the workplace, into the office two days ago. Um, so we prepared welcome kits for our people. Uh, you would see there, I'm not going to show that video, but there was a video that everyone also uh, watched. It's very similar to the uh, video showed earlier in terms of the nor new norms in the workplace. Mm -hmm. The message essentially is that this is the same workplace, but different setup. Same lift, different capacity, same entrance, different hello, because now you have to do the, the, the daily health checks, right? You would also see that in our office tables, there are QR codes where people would have to log in uh, because it helps us in monitoring and contact tracing if ever, yeah? Yep. Uh, next slide, please, which is the last slide. Uh, also, just some uh, a bit more photo. Next slide, please. 
Um, so it just shows you photos in the next slide uh, of the new normal in our factory. Uh, we continue with the measures we have already in place in the factory. So all employees are provided with all the safety precautionary equipments. We've added uh, additional hand wash basins in the factory. And obviously you would see there there are markers in the production area, work area, canteens to make sure that we follow proper social distancing. And we also do proper zoning in terms of the teams and zones in the, in the factory, because eventually this helps us in terms of monitoring and contact tracing. So that's it from, uh, yep. from you, Lieber. Uh, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sure that there will be a lot of uh, questions coming after. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. Romana Said. Um, from Unilever, Unilever showed that the private sector can adopt the very comprehensive model of well-being, not only physical health, not only about lack of disease, but also including the, you know, the, the mental and, and other side of well-being. And um, I'm get wordless to say, but because there's so many models, many principles, including what I like the most is the employee perspective, how we address this worker health issue. And you introduce four by four approach, you introduce care, connect, aspire, resilience, and energize. Um, so this, this is, um, and then um, in terms of implement this concept, we, we prepare a lot. We have learned from your good, good practice about um, this adaptation, about the training, about the kids, the manual to help people get go to the, the new norms. Um, mm -hmm. To all attendees, please type your question and your comments in the chat box. Please send it to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see you. Some might send directly to uh, specific, but please uh, send to all so that uh, we can select from your question uh, let's hear from Sever, Miss Susan Thomas um, from a Mighty Sever in from India. So, what um, what about um, the role of Sever and your concern in terms of informal women workers? Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much, Doctor. Good afternoon to everyone from India. I am Susan from the Self-Employed Women's Association. Next slide, please. Uh, the Self-Employed Women's Association uh, is a trade union of 1.8 million women workers across 17 or 18 plus a one state that is Gujarat where I'm placed out of where Seva started. So total 18 states in India. Next, please. So during the COVID-19 and post lockdown, I mean, post lockdown situation, what is it that we looked at? The informal workers, almost all of them, they were out of work, they were staying at home. So the first thing that hit them was they had no food. So we had to provide food kits to them. We had to provide them nutrition. So that was the first thing that we did. And we also connected them with the government, uh, PDS, the government uh, food distribution system so that everyone gets what, whatever uh, package the government was offering. It was also important to educate them and create an awareness around COVID-19, the do's and don'ts of COVID-19, what are the symptoms, what do they do about it? So we reached out to them through virtual platforms. And today, in the, since last four months, we've been doing that. And we, I'm proud to say that we have almost reached 300,000 women across 11 states in India by now. So during this whole process, we also distributed health kits to them, how to use masks, how to use, uh, how to clean, what are the safe practices? at home while they're working or outside. Some of the issues that came up were the mental health issues, the psychosocial issues, and we had to deal with them. We had to connect them with the government helpline, with professionals. And the model that they say were adopted was to identify community-based leaders, community-based leaders who were educated to provide information to them, to give them the necessary support. Seva also developed a micro insurance product to cover the costs of if any of the informal workers or frontline workers actually had, I mean, they were affected by COVID-19, a small package with a very small premium, which would cover their loss of wages as well as the expenses during COVID-19. Digital capacity building was done. We also helped them to, you know, uh, reach out and ensure that all the entitlements and rights that were provided, the new packages that came from the government was actually provided to them. So we kind of, we were the mediator and helped them actually access them in a good way. I would want to, uh, at the policy level, I would like to say here that what we are pushing is there is an in, 
uh, need to increase the investment in public health, especially for health personnel, for frontline workers. The ASHAs would not be enough in a pandemic situation like this. Next slide, please. Uh, what is it that we are, we are saying now, our experience? What we have learned is that online platforms and social media for education and awareness should be set up. In a situation like this, when the informal workers are sitting at home, how do we reach them? It was the first time that we did this, but we were successful. We were able to reach out to 300,000 women and we were able to tell them what they have to do and what are the precautions they have to take. So now it is important that at the local level, at the panchayat level, at the rural areas, at the urban levels, that this kind of a system should be developed. There have to be a database of phone numbers of all the uh, entire population at the local level. I already said that investing and developing on local leaders, on frontline health, health workers, both men and women, is very important at the community level. And these teams should be integrated at the local level. They should be sustained. They should be ready for any emergency responses. They have to be an emergency team. We have to look at it. And there has to be more investment on this. This is the team that can do the early detection of illnesses. They can monitor. They can do the surveillance. And also, we have to have emergency helplines. Now there are emergency helplines at the state level or the district level, at local levels which needs to be connected with others is very important. Building a strong referral network. During our experience of last four months, we have realized and we have learned that through the phones, through the online platform, we were able to build a referral network. We were able to identify cases that were within homes and refer them to the public health systems, refer them to the clinics, uh, refer them to the local frontline workers. And that worked very quickly and very fast. So that needs to be done. And the women, informal workers, were able to connect with us through the phone numbers. A lot of violent situations were there. There were pregnant women who needed help. They were able to connect to us. So this is a very important thing that we have to look at. Next slide, please. Thank you. Availability of protective uh, equipments, masks and gloves should be made available at every level, at the local level. And people should be educated and how to use it. We all have seen uh, you know, uh, you know, videos today, but how do we reach to informal workers who are in remote areas? We have to provide some way of education and how, what, is this, what are the social distancing? What do you mean by social distancing? In a community like in cultures like India where social distancing is not there. So how do we encourage people to do that? The other aspect that we noticed was there was a, we, I mean, a neglect of non-COVID health issues. There is a need to identify vulnerable groups and people with existing health conditions like NCDs and tuberculosis and pregnant women. We were neglecting them. We were focusing on COVID-19. The frontline workers should identify them, keep a database of them, ensure that they are adhering to the treatment protocols, ensure that they have adequate stock of medicines. We were trying to connect with them so that they can stock medicines with them. They need nutrition. Are they getting the nutrition? So this is very important in future that needs to be taken care of by the government, by the local health systems. Informal workers, like I said earlier, they were sitting at home, they lost their jobs. Now they want to go back to work. But the problem is, mm -hmm. what, do, what do they do with their children? So mm -hmm. it's very important to have full day crashes for them. So yep. with yep. new norms and new guidelines. And finally, there has to be an emphasis on mental health and occupational health more than ever at the primary health level with new norms, new guidelines, and there has to be the people at the local level should be trained to address these issues. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. Um, first of all, I appreciate um, the, the work that you do to reach out and help 300,000 uh, women nationwide. So that is just great. Um, and Seva, also endorse and practice a very comprehensive model again um, of health and well-being, including food, in, including mental health. And the point that um, we need to also protect the social worker as well. And in particular concern for the um, for informal sector, who is, has different setting or arrangement of work arrangement than the formal sector. Uh, and work from home doesn't mean that um, you are totally free from the uh, COVID-19, but they have other risks come up as well. 
and the use of online and digital platform, for example, the networking, the helpline, and other things. This is this time we need that more than ever. But let's hear from our SCAP team, uh, Ms. Chenna and Ms. Elizabeth. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Meck and the WHO team for the invitation to share our case study today. Next slide, please. I hope you all had a chance to see the video that played during registration. It is a part of our SCAP COVID communications campaign to help inform staff of the current measures we have in place. But if we take a step back for a minute, we would like to highlight how we got to this current state, provide a bit of context to describe the approach, what we did and what we learned. Next slide, please. This slide is a timeline of 2020 to date with the gray strip below showing the context, COVID milestones in Thailand, and the white strip above providing information on what UN SCAP and UN Thailand did during that time. With the first COVID cases confirmed in January, the Thailand UN security management team met and decided to activate and adapt the BCP governance structure for the, at that time, outbreak. As conditions worsened with local transmission, more preparedness measures were put in place. By mid-March, SCAP's BCP was updated to include a pandemic scenario and COVID daily case counts peaked. Two weeks later, the government declared a state of emergency and SCAP, along with all UN entities, started working from home in Thailand. <laughs> One important element which facilitated a close alignment of these two timelines was the governance structure and an integrated and collaborative approach we took across agencies and within SCAP. Next slide, please. On the left, this slide shows the governance structure used. Specifically, the pink text is for COVID response. The blue box at the top represents the headquarters level, while the darker green box in the middle represents the country or federal level, so to speak, for those in government sector. Certain tasks at this level were delegated to key agencies to reduce workload and streamline transactions. The light green box at the bottom represents UNSCAP, one UN agency which also acts as a landlord to 26 other UN entities in Thailand. The premises, our premises, is shown on the right. It's comprised of two office buildings and a conference center. Um, also outlined on the right, a risk-based approach that we took to managing our COVID response. It was informed by headquarters, WHO, and the host country. The CCMT developed a risk response, which defined the phases, triggers, and place emphasis on ensuring staff well-being through an evidence-based risk assessment. We at UNSCAP operationalized these evidence-based mitigating measures across four pillars, which my colleague Chetna will discuss. Next slide, please. Thank you, Elizabeth. So our return to the office, as uh, Elizabeth was mentioning, has been taking place in a phased approach. April and May being the, the really our planning phase for, for the return to office and where the focus was really on developing guidelines, standard operating procedures, developing checklists, but more importantly also undertaking trainings and doing OSH assessments with our occupational health and safety colleagues and constantly kind of adapting and looking at what, uh, how we could do better. In terms of phase one, we started that in May with the 20% return of the staff and, and we geared up in, on 1st of July to up to 50%. Um, in terms of the moving, the areas that we focused on was really looking at our facilities, commercial services within the building, but also looking at health and well-being of our staff. And then, and most important again is the communication, so ensuring that everybody is on board. The resources we use to guide our procedures, our uh, training and the assessments was from the UN Secretariat's Occupational Health and Safety Department, the Thailand's EDC, WHO, and then the UNCCMT, which Elizabeth mentioned. 
Uh, in terms of when we move to May, where we are looking at the phase one, we really started also developing a whole mechanism for monitoring our compliance with the measures that we put place but also working with all our clients, doing walkthroughs, doing simulations. We found doing simulations with our teams to, be to better put measures in place was really helpful. And this has also allowed us to be more agile because we found that as we put measures in place, we constantly had to monitor to see were they working, do people comply, and what are the changes that we constantly have to make. From July onwards, we continued with that and we are working also more on doing more kind of scenarios to look at how better we can put measures in place. And another big thing that we have now taken on, besides returning to the office, uh, the UN system in Thailand have also set up a UN returnees task force where we are looking at the return of staff from over 500 countries back into Thailand. So that's a big focus that we are doing now as well. If you go to the next slide, um, please. Here you will see all the measures we took in those four pillars. And really the focus was for us to, to continuously monitor and see whether the, the SOPs, the checklists, the compliance rates are being monitored. Are, are they working? Are they realistic? And the focus was really looking at physical distancing, the wearing of masks, looking at occupational rates in the building. We really worked with the different agencies provided heat maps to see how many people would be the maximum allowed on the floor. So not to adjust all the furniture, but look at how do you stagger your teams? How many people, you know, how can you have a team A and a team B to help uh, better manage the number of people in the building and to ensure that we maintain the physical distancing. Um, simulations, have, as I said, were also really important because they gave us a chance to step back to see whether we have really covered everything. It also helped us to work really hand in glove with our OSH colleagues. If we go to the next slide, we just want to highlight some of the things as lessons learned in our approach. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, in terms of back to office, I mean, I, I think we cannot stress enough. It's really important that you have a solid governance structure and to have an integrated approach. Really having those four pillars helped us a lot. And we also kind of worked in very multifunctional teams to put all the measures in place and, and to develop the monitoring systems. It's also important that you have to constantly be agile and adaptive. Things are changing all the time. This is a new norm. And there has never been some of these guidelines in place. So as we've developed them, we've also have to recalibrate, shift gear all the time. So that remains important. We also learned that as part of the new norm, as service providers, we had to change the way in which we work. A lot of our services are now only done by appointment. So this way we can manage the number of people in, in, in the respective areas. As we all know, the, the nature of meetings has changed. That therefore, here we are today all meeting virtually. And this has also put a lot of new emphasis in terms of how we do hybrid meetings. But health and well-being also continuously continues to be an important factor. We looked at issues on staff welfare, working from home, flexible working arrangements, providing counseling services, providing training, doing town halls. And during the first part of our time, we also had set up a COVID hotline to help staff and to just to, to give people kind of assurance because a lot of people not knowing what's going on but communications really is at the heart of it we really had to make sure that we continue providing different forms of communications not just on the measures but also to help build confidence so that staff feel comfortable to come back to work thank you thank you thank you very much so the, the UNS cap that show us as a uh, intergovernmental the organization, but show us a role model for the all work um, organization to to uh, practice. So I, what I like the most is that the planning facing and the flexible planning. And then we, you, you show us that you have to practice, you have to test and take lesson learned from the practice. That That is very important because um, this is a new challenge to, to all of us and we do not know the, um, exactly how the best to do so but uh, our list this learn that that can be shared is very much valuable um it seemed that uh, some some attendee may have some uh, difficulty in uh, typing in in the chat box please uh, my team is um the organizer you you help um uh, solving that issue uh 
let uh, let you know as soon as possible for those who cannot type in and for those who raise the hand um, there um, please type in because moderator cannot see your hands up please type in the question first and we, i will call you later on please type in your question and last but not least please go uh, we we'll go to dr ivan ivanov ivan the floor is yours Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peck. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, those of you who may be in other parts of the world, good morning and good evening. Um, it's, it's my pleasure to be with you today, and uh, I really appreciated all the presentations that, uh, that were preceding my presentation. I want to put your attention to some um, phenomenon that uh, we are getting more and more concerned globally. It, these are the outbreaks of COVID-19 in the workplace. Next, please. Next slide, please. Maybe you hear in uh, the news and uh, read in the newspapers about uh, different outbreaks affecting uh, meatpacking plants, affecting food industries, affecting uh, garment industries, affecting mines, affecting a lot of different uh, workplaces, offices, call centers, uh, uh, different workplaces. And um, there has been a review published by the McMaster University in uh, June that we're trying to update uh, on the clusters at, at workplaces which identified that the occupations most at risk are the frontline providers, uh, frontline service providers, but now in the context of um, <clears throat> Uh, reopening uh, non-essential workplaces. These are also uh, occupations that come into close contact with the public. So it's, uh, of course, healthcare professionals. It's uh, the traditional and uh, mostly emphasized and studied, but also it's a lot of reports of drivers, uh, service and sales workers, cleaning domestic workers, which is a large number of actually the workforce, production, education, community, social services, construction, extraction workers, and public safety. The, uh, the uh, review uh, of McMaster University also identified several risk factors, uh, close contact with others, business meetings, interactions with colleagues and clients, close proximity, lack of hygiene, ventilation, crowded working and transportation conditions and crowded dormitories, which was uh, well known as uh, the, the reason for the second wave of uh, COVID-19 in Singapore, for example. Next one, please. And uh, the common features of uh, all these clusters is that uh, they affect primarily low middle skilled occupations with frequent contacts with clients, work and customer premises or public places. And uh, um, they are introduced to the workplace uh, by asymptomatic or very mild symptomatic index cases. And uh, they result as uh, prolong uh, as a result of prolonged contact with the index case in enclosed environments such as meeting room or processing facility, poor ventilation and the use of individual air conditioners and fans was also identified as a risk factor. Inadequate workplace policies for stay home in, if and well if uh, workers are not provided with financial compensation when they have to self-isolate or they have to stay in quarantine, they are likely to come home. And actually we find in the review some meatpacking uh, plants in the United States, even they provide incentives for workers to come to the workplace. So this is uh, incentivizing sick workers to come to work. Also, there are some clusters linked to social events, parties among co-workers outside of the workplace, and then it counts as a workplace cluster, and then the whole workplace is closed. Uh, next one, please. Yes, the prevention WHO issued on the 10th of May, WHO issued uh, a global uh, interim guidance on prevention and mitigation of COVID-19 at the, the workplace, uh, emphasizing on physical distancing at least meter from anyone all the time, everywhere at the workplace, but also at the community and if possible at home, ensure compliance through engineering and administrative controls. And if it is not possible, to apply physical distancing, then the first thing to consider is to whether the activity can be suspended. And if the activity cannot be suspended and carried out in an alternative way, then wearing at least face covering cloth masks six layers. Uh, 
providing facilities for hand hygiene. And we saw how Unilever has done that and for respiratory hygiene, environmental cleanup, disinfection of commonly touched surfaces, but we don't recommend any tunnels of uh, spraying of people in tunnels and spraying of people with disinfectants. Regular risk assessment to update and safety for safety protocols, think situations change, uh, social mixing patterns change, compliance change, so risk assessment has to be carried regularly and risk communication and engagement of workers is very important to assure that they comply with the measures, that they know what they're doing, and they also spread that uh, healthy and safe behavior in the community and at home, but also that they are free to also express their safety concerns. So this is important to have this feedback. Policies to stay home if unwell, sick leave policies, and to remove any incentives to continue to work if sick, and facilitate isolation of people suspected of having COVID-19 and contact tracing. Next one, please. WHO has um, an emerging uh, <clears throat> collaboration with the private sector in the response of COVID-19. I was uh, very pleased to see the presentation of uh, Unilever that exactly fits into what WHO has the private sector to do to protect the stakeholders, to protect the businesses, to provide essential supplies, and uh, to provide also financial support uh, to global yeah. activities. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ivan Ivanov. So that it is very comprehensive, very informative, and showing many uh, of uh, product that that we already plan. Um, the including, um, you know, we have um, classic uh, health re occupational health risks, and then we have the additional one, and and to me, like um, the crowded setting, the lack of hygiene and hand washing and vent air ventilation, which is not uh, prepared for that is uh, uh, what you call emerging health risks. And workplace should be a part as of the solution to COVID-19 in, in the society for the case tracing this and that um, is, uh, is a must and then prevention as well. So let's hear from the, um, our uh, attendees. Your participant, please type your your question and comment. My first cue go to uh, Miss Neni Suryani. Sorry, uh, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. Neni, please, are you with us? Please unmute your mic and deliver your question. Uh, it seemed okay. We pass. Um, Neni, please come back and. Uh, otherwise, I will read your question later on. Now, let's go to Myanmar with Dr. Kao Khan Kwang, or Dr. KKK. Please unmute your mic, please, and deliver your question. Unmute your mic first. Uh, we, we cannot hear you, Dr. KKK. Uh, we cannot hear you. Okay. Um, the question, Doctor KKK, type is um, perhaps uh, to the uh, to to Susan. Um, he asked that how is the mental health care support to self-employee. But uh, any other the uh, panelists can can answer uh, this question. Um, is Neni back? Neni Suryani. Can I answer that question? Uh, uh, hold on, hold on. We have um, two or three questions and then we go to you, Susan. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep, yep. Neni, are you with us? Uh, if not, then let's go to the uh, Hana. Hana Septanti. Hana? Sorry if I uh, pronounced your name wrong. Are you with us? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Hello. Please, Can please, you please. Me? Yep, you have 30 yeah. seconds, please. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I am Hannah. I work at Ministry of Health. I would like to ask some question for Ms. Rowena. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to know uh, how the government take on monitoring the COVID prevention program on your companies. Do they visit or do they have some hotline or some kind of uh, online platform for your company to submit 
the form of some, something. And second of all, uh, what about the workers? How they compliance to the program? Thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, Neni, are you with us? The third question from the floor. Okay. Uh, if not, I, I will read the, the question from Neni Suryani. So uh, Neni asks that um, I work at public health center, my coworker and I have protected ourselves, but the people around our workplace haven't got the protection. And until now, the case around us increased. Some of my coworkers have infected, even if we protect ourselves, what should we do for other? And we cannot work from home. That is quite common. Can uh, we go to the, uh, starting with um, Ibudia? That is one question about how to monitor uh, the enforcement of your protocol as well. Ibudia, you have um, one minute, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mac. So uh, for the health protocol actually should be enforced with the sanction. Thus, we can ensure the comp compliances. Yeah? In Indonesia, some local authorities already launched local regulation to ensure the adherence to protocol uh, implementation at national level right now. Uh, we are drafting the presidential instruction. Uh, now is at final stage. So there will be strong, more stronger uh, uh, law enforcement actually to ensure the compliance to the health protocols uh, and there is also uh, in addition uh, to what we all we also value efforts done by industries uh, mm -hmm. for their commitment towards the new implementation we also give reward certificate to stimulate actually the the enforcement uh, within the uh, stakeholders uh, for some initiative, for example, restaurants that follow the yep. regulation and so forth. So okay, thank you, thank you. So you, you use both um, hard and soft power yes, to sir. promote this uh, compliance as well. Uh, Ms. Rovena, this question to you, particularly about the yes. compliance of worker, please. Yes, yes. So the Thai government has this application called the Thai China app. So all, uh, uh, all our employees, because they're also citizens of Thailand, uh, also have that app and Unilever also uses that. Now, in terms of government controls, the government, uh, specifically the Thai government, has put in uh, control procedures for different countries before they, uh, for different companies, sorry, uh, in terms of COVID prevention. So Unilever obviously is very compliant with that. In fact, we take it a step further. We, um, our external communication group, proactively reaches out to the government and present our, um, uh, our measures, uh, even, uh, you know, just in terms of best practice and also to just get billed government. Um, we also connect with the Department of Disease Control to just make sure that we are not just in compliance, but if there's anything that we feel that can also help uh, other industries, we also uh, uh, proactively share that. In terms of worker compliance, uh, I mentioned earlier in my presentation that we have the tier program, the tier system. So factory and office follows that tier system and there are very strict guidelines. So obviously we train our people in terms of that tier guidelines as well uh, to make sure everyone follows. I mentioned earlier in the presentation as well that even for people coming into the office, both the line managers and the employee, everyone goes through a mandatory uh, training program to make sure that they are all aware of our uh, protocols in place. Um, very early days because we have just gotten people back into the office uh, and so far, you know, we've been getting very good feedback and very good, uh, you know, quote unquote compliance. Uh, you know, I, I don't really want to call it that word, but people actually are, are uh, they follow because they also know that it's for their uh, own safety. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a good question come from the Dr. Sadhana to ask that are there any clear guidelines how we can dispose the reuse of the mask at the workplace because now everyone use workplace. Normally the, we have a good guideline from healthcare setting, but what about workplace? But uh, before that, we can go to Susan. Susan, there's a specific question to you about mental health. Yes, uh, the question, I mean, what we did, we kind of actually uh, trained grassroots uh, community leaders. First of all, uh, trained them on COVID-19 and uh, we call them uh, master trainers who we identified across 18 states and today we have about 800 plus master trainers 
or community leaders who are taking the message on COVID-19. From amongst them, we train some of them on uh, basic counseling that they could do, and we call them at barefoot counselors. So these are women uh, uh, who are able to provide basic primary level counseling support to women who need them. And, when, and they're already connected to the phone. And through the phone, uh, the women share their problems. And if there are a secondary and tertiary level of support needed, we try and connect them, connect them to the public helpline numbers or to professionals wherever they are available. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and then we can go to our ESCAP team, um, Chetna, Elizabeth, or Dr. Teresa. Yes. Yep. What was the question? It is this general question and, and, and showing you about um, the compliance, the monitor, and how you can uh, expand this, uh, your good practice to, to, to outside. Any tips? Sure, yeah, sure. Um, so um, part of our monitoring and compliance involved, for phase one, we implemented a series of mitigating measures, but we wanted to see how much people were complying with ma wearing masks, social distancing. Um, so we created a, a QR feedback code through, the, through HR and they developed a, a feedback mechanism so staff could scan the QR code and they would be asked a series of questions, not just about if they feel comfortable in the premises, but also about the face mask wearing, or do they feel people are being compliant? What kind of commute are they taking to the office? So we can kind of start to get some metrics to uh, understand how many people are taking taxis to the office, how many people are using their own personal transportation. Um, in addition, we have a, a, a system in place with safety ambassadors is what we're calling them. And so it's yep. within our administrative team, we are um, trying to identify where we, as well as with the commercial services team, where we find non-compliance, how many people are not wearing masks, and we're measuring those metrics regularly, uh, as well as occupancy limits on the premises. From day one, we've been monitoring are we meeting the 20% threshold for phase one? And then for phase two, are we meeting the 50% threshold or less? So what we know is that with the data, we can say with confidence, we're not exceeding 20%, we're not exceeding 50%, which is what our, our governing body, our, our, our CCMT says, hey, we wanna keep you in this threshold for this phase as one means of mitigating the, the, uh, the, the risk, right? So. Yep. I think I think that kind of can, covers can, can it. Can I have 30 seconds about your portal where people can come in and report? Please, Dr. Tialisa. Um, so the EarthMed portal is not actually owned by by SCAP. It was developed by our um, by our HQ colleagues, our uh, Department of Healthcare Management and Occupational Safety and um, Health. Um, a unit from um, from uh, New York. So what happens is uh, um, Secretary at UN agencies and six other uh, UN agencies that do not fall under the Secretariat um, um, under the Secretariat um, can report into that portal, which is just like you know, um, if you are a staff member. Um, who can report into that portal, you can basically just go there and if you test positive for COVID-19, for example, if you or your dependents um, and even your household members test positive for COVID-19, you should report into that portal. You will encounter a series of questions which uh, provides uh, more details on, you know, how were you exposed? Um, how many people did you potentially expose? And you know, those things. And then once you've um, completed that um, reporting, there is a, um, uh, an appropriate medical service within your region who would actually accept that report. And that medical service would then reach out to that person or to that staff member who reported to get a little bit more detail 
on you know how they were infected um, do a little bit of contact tracing and also um, just reach out to provide further support if they need it be it you know um, psychosocial or referring to um, so, uh, their local healthcare providers okay thank you thank you very much that's just a good model uh, before I go to the Dr. Ivan, there's some specific question to you about masks, about this possible the reuse of masks and sanitizing masks. And we have a concern on chat box about are uh, we overuse of the PPE to some the you no know, risk setting thing? Uh, what about your idea? Right. Um, uh, I just uh, uh, put in the in the chat the link to the WHO recommendations on the use of masks. And uh, we we do recommend uh, uh, when physical distancing cannot be uh, practically observed, first to consider whether the activity can be suspended, and second, if not, then wearing uh, cloth masks at least uh, uh, six layers. And uh, the guidance provides a lot of information about how this mask can be reused. Uh, uh, they can be washed. Uh, depends on, the, of course, the fabric and the, the quality. Uh, some of them can be can be washed uh, uh, just in the in the washing machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is there is unfortunately currently there are no other solutions. We don't have a vaccine, and even if we don't if we have a vaccine, we don't know how effective and how long it will be. So we have to live to learn with the virus and respect physical distancing and hand hygiene at the first place. Okay, thank you. We have a good, uh, uh, now the, the chat box start to heat up. Uh, we have a good comment on from Rainy Case. Uh, I think about that um, people are boring about COVID-19 for many months and new normal become, become the normal thing. Um, what is strategy we can use to, you know, to keep the, the concern high, the awareness high, besides only wearing masks and watching hands to prevent ourselves. We go to the last three live question. Can we go to Indar? Uh, Indar, are you with us? Indar Ramadona. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yep, 30 seconds, please. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, for working space area, we need air ventilation. So uh, in the building there, uh, which is the uh, non windows there, uh, is it okay if we uh, installed uh, air purifier with ozone plasma? Uh, uh, of course, we, we will use timer like uh, to schedule it in the middle of the night and then uh, in the morning, when all the office workers start uh, working, uh, they will they can have a really good air circulation there. Okay, thank you. Can thank I you. go to the, uh, Dr. Rajaram? Are you with us, Dr. Rajaram? Yes. Yes, please deliver your question. Yeah. Ah. Uh... I also uh, mentioned in the chat box. So uh, very often uh, people are interested to uh, have some kind of testing. Uh, so if the, the people do not have any kind of the symptoms, so before uh, returning to the work, uh, uh, what is the experience? Uh, any country or any sector or any agency has uh, some kind of experience on the, uh, this procedure or whether it is the necessary or not, or, uh, how the agencies have been dealing with this issue. Thank you. Yep. Um, the question I understand right is about should we test the people before going back to work? So that is another, the, another yes, interesting yes, idea. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And lastly, can I go to the Al Alfie? Sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. You have 30 seconds. Alfie, are you with us? It seems that you have done a very good job there. Alfie Nur, Aini. Yes. Yeah, please do have 30 seconds. Yeah. So good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Alfie and here I am representing representing my company, PT My Sumiri, as one of the uh, garment industry in Central Java, Indonesia. So in this case, uh, we would like to show some of our best practices actually in implementing the World Health Organization protocols and then the health protocols uh, designed and made by our health organization, uh, our health ministry so in this case we would like to 
uh, share us our best practices. So for example, we now also automated our hand uh, sanitation. So if mm -hmm. in other places, maybe hand, sanita hand sanitizer is just pushed manually, in our places now we are using it to be automated. So okay. this is aligned with Industry 4.0 as well and some okay. of the facial cleaner as well. Yep, yep, thank you. So I'm sure there's as many good practice that we can share and we can learn from each other. Uh, can, because it's time limitation, can we go for 30 seconds for our panelists for your last word? And you can select an, an issue to respond, including Dr. Ivan on, on the ventilator thing. thing. Okay, uh, can I go to Ibu Dia? Are you still with us? Yes, yes. Uh... So I, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, good uh, practices and sharing experience yeah, from, the, uh, from the floor, from the audiences also. But, uh, and also the, what the key message is actually there is no, nothing fits all. So mm -hmm. everything should be uh, adjust, adjusted actually out, at the current situation, you know, yep. you, the, the situation of the pandemic, the situation of the uh, regulation and uh, the, the culture of the uh, people itself. Like uh, the response from one of the, uh, in terms of the terms, yeah, the new normals mm -hmm. that can mm -hmm. mislead you. So yep. in Indonesia, we, we change, not the new norms, not normal, baru, yep. yeah, not, not mm -hmm. new normal, but we change it into the uh, uh, adaptasi kehidupan baru, so mm -hmm. ABK. Okay. So it, that we need to adopt the new lifestyles, not yep. new normal. Same yep. Yep. That's yep. to avoid the mislead. That's okay. actually Thank probably you. for me. Thank yep. you. The, the contact fluency is very important. Can we go to Miss Rovana? You show us uh, very good in terms of, uh, you know, this program as an investment, not only expense. Find yes. out from you, please. Yeah. So uh, first, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Unilever, our, pur our purpose has always been making sustainable living commonplace. And it's no exception, even at this time of COVID. Yeah. People safety, employee well-being remain and will always be our top priority. We are aware of our position in all the different countries, given that we are a huge uh, multinational with products across home and personal care, foods, um, and, and home care. Um, and so we are aware of our position and uh, aware that we can do a lot to really help the community. So really message also for everyone, which is something we also tell our people all the time, take care of yourself, take care of your family, follow all procedures, precautionary procedures in abundance, um, because this not just take care, take, takes care of yourself, but takes care of your society. And also we, what, one thing we consistently tell our employees as well is to uh, you know, report when, when, when there are cases, be honest with your personal health conditions because it helps not just you, but the company and society. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sure that uh, everyone is a uh, part of the solution. Can I go to Susan Thomas? Yes, please, Susan, thank, please. You. thank you very much. Uh, one last thing that I would like to say that let's not ignore or forget the informal workers. Mm -hmm. They are the majority of the workers. So we yep. need to look at them, we need to educate them, and we need to have guidelines, trade-wise guidelines for domestic workers, for construction workers, home-based workers, street vendors. They are at high risk. So mm -hmm. how do we reach out to them? How do we educate them? How do we uh, make them you know, follow uh, work practices that are safe? Uh, yep. Some of them yep. work from home, so that's my last word. Okay, thank you. We cannot uh, neglect the most vulnerable part. It is important uh, as the majority as well. Um, can we go to the SCAP team? Can I at least get, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, this is uh, Chetna. Just to, there's a question from, I think, Badri Tapa about yep. how to avoid overcrowding. I think one of the things we learned also was to really stagger your workforce. You know, you really have to divide your workforce up into teams make sure that each of them can do back up each other so that you have to have team A, team B, team C, and that has helped and it does work. We have tried it and it's working and that way you can avoid overcrowding, but also you mitigate your risk. If one team does get infected, at least you have 
somebody else that could continue with the operations. We also want to touch briefly on ventilation and I'll ask my colleague uh, Stephen Rieger, mm -hmm. who's in charge of our facilities here at ASCAP, and he'll give you some yeah, please, event, details please. of our experience. Thanks. A quick good day to you, everybody. Yeah, here at ASCAP, we look very carefully at our uh, air conditioning system and our ventilation. And because we have our climate, we don't have 100% fresh air. So we, you, we generally here in Thailand, for ASCAP anyway, we apply, apply the ASHRAE standards as much as possible. So ASHRAE have a, recently issued a whole bunch of documents on returning to office, returning to schools, uh, guidance for reopening schools, guidance for this. So they talk about filtr air filtration, if you can't put fresh air in, what type of air filtration. So we have a MERV 14 filter system, thankfully, which meets their MERV 13 minimum for filtration. So we're in very good condition here and luckily enough. <laughs> Yep. Thank you. And so, just to add to that, I think what thing, one thing that's key is I think at a regional level where um, sometimes uh, the discussion is about getting proper ventilation in place by opening the windows and getting that fresh air, but not every location has that luxury. So the filtration system with the right level of filtration, as Stephen's mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, can, can be a, a substitute for that from what we have found from our experience. I mean, yep. certainly do your own research, but that's kind of the path that we took. So hopefully that helps others. Yep. There's a lot of guidance out there available mm -hmm. for everybody. Free of charge. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you um, for the opportunity to let us participate and share our, our case study. Yep. Thank you very much. We learned a lot from uh, as captain. Um, can let's go to Dr. Ivan. Ivan, please. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Mech. Uh, certainly, this this outbreak and this pandemic has uh, demonstrated how unprepared our businesses and workplaces, including our own workplaces, for for handling the pandemic and uh, for handling an outbreak of infectious disease. So that's a new frontier for occupational health to expand further and to help businesses to, to prepare and to, to, to better respond and prepare for whatever may happen. We had uh, Ebola, there is chikungunya, there is uh, dengue, there are any kind of uh, fevers and any kind of outbreaks. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know what will be the next one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's, um, please accept my uh, apology to, for all attendees as uh, seem to have um, a lot of questions come to the last five minutes. So I cannot um, read it all, but there's many interesting questions, for example, from Myanmar about the pregnant uh, woman worker, uh, about the worker who now jobless who take care of their, their health before going back. And there is many others, uh, good question as well. Uh, if you could scroll through the chat box, you see that. Um, before the end, um, can I go to Leslie for a summary, please? Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Mack. Um, and we will look at the chat box after the, um, after the webinar finishes, so if we can get some more um, information and answers to these questions, we'll do this by email. Um, I just have two slides. The first one, um, just to highlight some of the key WHO documents. Um, in, the web, in the webinar webpage, you'll see that there's a bibliography of selected documents which are relevant to workers' health. There are about 20. So, I mean, this, these are ones which are selected from the main WHO COVID-19 page. These range from technical guidance notes um, on preparing for return to work, question and answers and so on, uh, environmental considerations, particularly the um, disinfection that we've spoken about, vulnerable groups and informal sector workers, masks, mode, modes of transition. Um, and there are some specific workplace guidance on the accommodation sector, prisons, schools, food businesses, aviation, camps, and construction workers. So there's those, they're all on the web, uh, web page with um, for you to download. Uh, if I could just quickly summarize some of the uh, points from today's um, session then um, I think we heard uh, good case studies from government, private sector, non-governmental organizations, as well as international organizations. We heard that strong and high level leadership, collaboration across sectors and effective communication in different forms was needed. 
and this was to promote the new ways of working, gain confidence and ensure a better norm after the COVID-19 ends. But currently we're all aware that the pandemic is not yet over. The measures described reflected uh, different levels and phases of the pandemics in different countries and the type of work being undertaken. A holistic approach of well-being was described, including physical, mental and emotional needs of workers, but with health recognised as key to economic recovery, not talking about just the absence of infection. Measures described were based on risk assessment principles, identifying low, medium and high risk workers and applying well-developed and but also innovative public health and social distancing measures, adapting workplaces to reduce levels of occupancy and new modes of working, including working from home, which also need equal attention. The special needs of vulnerable populations were highlighted, particularly in the informal sector and returning migrant workers. A social, economic, as well as health protection is needed for them. And we heard that virtual and mobile networks and systems were critical, as well as follow up to see that the support is indeed reaching those vulnerable groups. Um, increased surveillance and vigilance is needed for the detection of possible workplace clusters and outbreak, outbreaks. Um, as the new norm evolves, we, we, we learned perhaps to not to stop talking about new norm, but new lifestyle continues to evolve. Building in additional adaptation is needed as well because the understanding of the virus continues to evolve. Um, also, we heard about sim simulating and testing new measures. So a very comprehensive view of surveillance and digital vigilance is still needed as, as we proceed to get back to the new normal or to have a new lifestyle in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very informative in one slide. Um, what we learned very much from this uh, session is that um, this is our chair challenge and we have a chair future. All together is not time to blame, but it's time to work together. It's time to share together what we learn and we learn together to build back better. So this is our um, collective effort. Um, next week, uh, next Thursday, please uh, prepare your healthy diet in front of your laptop and we we'll discuss about how to promote healthy diet in the region during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. We have um, Dr. Chisru from um, the WHO, Dr. Van Varanli, Varanli from Thailand. We have uh, Professor Sinadradi from India and Dr. Matthias uh, from Philippines, so from ADB. Um, so let's discuss about nutrition and healthy diet in next week. But for now, thank you very much for all attendees. Thank you very much for all panelists. This is um, very interesting, uh, very challenging, uh, and uh, very informative. I hope you have uh, learned from this um, one now uh, session. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. See you next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.